but good afternoon and um, welcome to the Apprentice Automation Challenge 2023 welcome webinar. Um, I hope you all can see my slides. Can you all just confirm for me? Can everyone see my slides? Yes, I can see them. Perfect. Thank you, Ted. Great. Um, so I'm just going to introduce myself um, first. I'm Fiona Wong. Um, I work in the events team at the IMAC -E, um, and I will be looking after the operational element of the um, competition this year. Um, I will be coordinating with the key stakeholders um, involved within the competition and also provide the administrative support um, for um, those involved looking after the technical aspects of the competition. Um, I will be your main point of contact um, for the competition itself um, and you can reach me via the AC um, inbox, so the ac.challenge.imeki.org email address, any queries, um, anything like that, just pop an email over there, uh, which many of you have done so already, um, and I can answer any questions or um, pass them on to the judges um, and they can give you, they can advise um, on any queries that you may have. So just a few housekeeping notes for today. Um, if you are not presenting, um, please do mute your microphones um, just to avoid any interference. Um, any questions that you may have, feel free to pop it in the chat box um, and we can address them during the Q&A session um, at the very end of the webinar today. The webinar will be recorded um, and it will be made available to all team members um, post event. I will pop an email to everyone um, after and it will also be uploaded to the iMeki YouTube channel and the Apprentice Automation Challenge website. So you'll be able to access it uh, post event. But as I said, any questions, just let me know. So moving on to today's agenda, um, let me just move to the next slide. Um, so the agenda today, we will have various members of the IMEC AAC um, steering group um, covering the different areas of the competition um, as displayed on screen. But first, we'll kind of kick off um, about the IMEC -E, um, about the um, membership benefits and also the Apprentice and EngTech awards available. So I think, David, um, if Feel free to um, unmute your mic and I will move over to your. Are you able to share your slides, David? Uh, yeah, I can do if I can get. Um, bear with me a sec. If it'll allow me to share. I'll stop sharing for you. Uh, can everyone see that? Yep. It's in full screen. Perfect. Brilliant. Great stuff. Well, it's, uh, good afternoon all. Uh, it's quite a brief presentation. This usually takes a, a lot longer, but I'll be as quick as I can. Um, conscious of people coming behind me and, and after me. So yeah, my name is Dave Curtis. I'm part of the business development team from the Amec -E. uh, I'm going to quickly talk about a lot of membership and the benefits um, to yourselves as professionally registered engineers going forwards. Um, so First thing really, just a, a little explanation of what is professional registration. Um, it's a little bit of background on the IMEC. -E. We've been around uh, 176 years now. Um, you know, we we uh, registered by Engineering Council to to offer, uh, to, sorry, to accredit uh, degrees, apprenticeships and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we, we offer three levels of registration. Um, but professional registration basically is is to allow you to to highlight your knowledge and understanding, competence, etc., to peers and and employers. It allows you to demonstrate a, a commitment to professional standards, so that you're working at a you know professional level, um, and and you're committed to the uh, industry. It also helps you demonstrate commitment to uh, developing, enhancing, and enhancing uh, your competence. Uh, and also to the wider community as well. So de demonstrating that and promoting professionalism in the industry uh, to the wider community, uh, whether that be through things like STEM events or, or for volunteering for the, the local regional committees and, and that kind of stuff. So do get involved with as much as you can. 
So general benefits of professional registration, you know, it's, it's internationally recognised that competence um, and the knowledge and understanding uh, people recognise around the world that you're at a certain standard and that you work to a certain standard, uh, you know, and your commitment to the industry as well. It can also offer career enhancement and create opportunities for yourself. You know, there's been research done and um, which shows that there's increased earning potential there for, for people who are professionally registered as well. Uh, you can also be part of a professional institution. It allows that and gain access to, to lifelong learning um, from the IMEC as well. So there's loads and loads of courses and, and events and things like that you can you can attend and get involved with. Um, and just a little quote there from from a member. It's it's allowed them to deliver projects accurately and on time, particularly when meeting uh, prospective clients. And it can help the business, uh, you know, get new new clients, new business, and that kind of stuff. So some of the specific uh, member benefits with the IMAC, you get access to the world's largest engineering or mechanical engineering library uh, resource centre. It's lots and lots of information, journals, artefacts and that kind of stuff, all available uh, as an IMAC member. Uh, you get a good support network, so that can be from things such as uh, you know maybe debt advice or if you've got additional learning needs and that kind of stuff. Um, but all sorts of things that the team that I work in, so we offer application workshops, um, you know, guidance and surgeries where if you've got a, a question or a query, we can we can help and advise and, and guide you through an application process and, and also help with sort of interview techniques and that kind of stuff. You also get access to a leading engineering database and the professional engineer magazine. And there's loads of prizes and awards out there, which you know I think will be mentioned uh, later on this afternoon. There's lots and lots of events and networking for you. You get to make contacts with business, with like-minded engineers, other members, just to increase that that network and that connection to to help you as you progress through your career. There's lots of learning development some reduced fees for some CPD courses um, you know, some are free with webinars and, and YouTube videos and, and loads of things out there. There's also career guidance and support um, and some volunteering opportunities. I've already said the local committees are, are really, really looking for volunteers to get involved in different and various, various areas. So please, you know, look at that if, if it's something you may be interested in. Just quickly over the levels of membership. So we, we offer free student and apprentice membership, um, but for engineering technician, you need to have got your MVQ or an approved apprenticeship, and some work experience. For incorporated, we're looking for a degree level um, or HNC, HND with a, a further learning plan, three years in industry and then the application. Um, and then finally for chartered, we look for the, the masters or degree um, plus further learning and four years from there as well. There's also a, a further option if you know somebody or yourself have been in industry for a long period of time, they can go down the career learning assessment route um, if you don't have those academic qualifications. And that's it really. So a whistle stop tour there of, of the IMEC and the, the benefits. If there's any further questions, please, please feel free to, to email myself or on that address. Um, any information you might need or guidance, uh, I'm absolutely happy with uh, with helping and etc give you advice if needs be so thank you for your patience and and listening today and i'll pass back over to the owner thank stop. you david uh, i'll um, just stop sharing my screen bear with me one okay. second i'm a bit of a dinosaur with the technology so um, <laughs> no yeah, worries it, hopefully that stops sharing now perfect so i'll just quickly reshare mine and we'll move over to Raymond, who will talk about our apprentice and NCHEC um, awards. So over to you, Raymond. OK, thank you. Uh, basically, the IMEC Trustee Board Awards Committee monitors some £15 million pounds worth of investments and uses the income from it to generate awards, prizes and scholarships for all levels of engineering, from apprentice up to industry leaders. The ones that are particularly interesting for you today would be the Brian Hildrew Apprentice of the Year Award. Brian Hildrew himself was an apprentice engineer 
and rose through his career to finish up as president of the Institute of Mechanics and Engineers. So I guess my message to you today, guys, is dare to dream. The EngTech of the Year Award is also issued for engineering technicians, as is the EngTech Visionary. And there are two other rather specialised awards which will gradually be phased out because of their legacy awards where the funds are running down. The Brisbane Prize <coughs> is for, right here I quote, the best project work associated with an SQA level seven qualification in mechanical engineering at an education institute in Scotland. And similarly, the CC Pounder Award is the best project work with a level three qualification at an educational institution in Northern Ireland. So those were a little bit specialised, but if I tell you the Red Book, which is all the event awards and scholarships, is some 250 pages long. <coughs> but we, <coughs> pardon me, we have worked on our website to try and make it more accessible. You can see the next slide, please. If you can click to the next slide, please. Oh, yeah. You'll find the link there, which gives you a link to all your engineering awards for apprentices and eng techs. And again, if there's any questions at all, an email to the institution will get a prompt answer. And it's also of interest to you as you progress in your career that we issue a lot of scholarships for foundation degrees, for full degrees, for masters and for postgraduate study. So that can also be interesting in helping you progress as you go on. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Raymond. Um, great. So now we'll move on to giving an overview um, of the um, challenge itself. So I'm just going to start off by showing everyone um, the video from 2022. Um, hopefully you'll be able to hear my audio. Um, just let me just reshare it because I don't think I've selected that option. <laughs> okay. Can I just confirm everyone can see my slides still? Yeah, I've got video and sound. Perfect, thank you. Over the past few months we've been working on an artificial turf cleaning robot. Artificial turf has become more and more of an option for households, especially because it's low maintenance. But there is a problem with the fact that debris does get onto it a lot of the time and it's really annoying to clean. So having a device that can do that, especially when it's automated and you can control the whole device via an app, allows for you to clean it and even have to be at home. I chose to participate because I thought it would be a difficult and new experience. The thing I've enjoyed most about the challenge would be working with a new team of people who I hadn't got the chance to really work with as closely before, as well as overcoming new challenges that I wouldn't have had the chance to tackle in the company otherwise. I would absolutely recommend this challenge to other people. It's a fantastic experience and it's something new for everyone. The day's uh, been absolutely great. It's been really good to see the apprentices and what they've accomplished through the challenge. And I personally find it really inspirational to see how many skills they've learned and how much they've taken from the competition and it makes you look forward to the future of engineering and know that the future is in their hands. So now we will now um, move on to our last year champions, Team Sal. Um, Gianna and Sam, if you can um, unmute yourselves and if you can talk about your, your experience from last year and any tips that you may have for our teams this year. Thank you. Okay, so hello everybody. Can you hear me okay? 
Yep, I can hear you loud and clear. Perfect, thank you. And Sam's also sharing our PowerPoint. So Sam and I were part of Team Cell and we were the grand champions. We won the overall award and also the um, peer review award for 2022. Next slide, please, Sam. Ooh. Thank you. Ooh. Perfect. So we were Team Sam, uh, oh, team, team Sal, sorry. And we were all bachelor's and apprentices at Leonardo. Three of us were technical apprentices, as you can see. Abby was our team leader and she also led software. Sam was um, led uh, electronics. Jake led um, design and research. And then you've got Jacob, who's manufacturing technical. He led design and research as well with Jake. And you've got me, a project management degree apprentice. And I led sort of business alongside Luca, who was a business apprentice. And we worked together on the report. Thanks, uh, so our concept was built with the idea of helping as many different people as we could. Uh, so well, our device mainly was for individuals that couldn't necessarily help themselves uh, fill up like water jugs and use big bottles. So it was designed as a simple push button to dispense drinks for their enjoyment while trying to reduce waste and increase in convenience for them as well. Uh, it can be used in a variety of different settings for family household, uh, for in a family household setting, sorry, it can be used for like squash and juices for kids. Otherwise in like more adult situations like parties and stuff like that, we thought we could have like more alcoholic drinks in it. Uh, and obviously we strive to help uh, keep everyone drinking responsibly so we gave out measuring jugs to help with either juice and make sure you get the right amount not too much or the same obviously with alcohol make sure you're not getting too much alcohol at once so in order to ensure that we understood the work we, we needed to complete as a team we created a work breakdown structure and we broke this down into different business functions or different components that will contribute to our hyd hydration station which is the name of our product so we could, we're able to visually see the work that needs to be considered. So this made sure that we had focused meetings as well, because we knew that with project management, we had to constantly revise our Gantt chart, but with software as well, we had to write the code for operation and make sure we follow that process for the code. So it made sure we knew our workload and this definitely helped with time management and sort of extra support we needed. So we followed an accurate timeline and we were very aware and really understood where our effort and time commitment would, would go. Uh, so we went then went on to designing a block diagram for our system. So that we had an overall view of what we were expecting to build and how we expected the user to interact with our uh, product. So obviously inside the blue bit is what the user wouldn't see, but the user on the outside should be able to touch the buttons and then liquid dispensers and everything inside that blue box. We then need to think, how are we going to make this as seamless as possible for the user on the other end? Uh, we then decided to move on to software structure, so none of us really had much software experience, so we decided to lay out a flowchart, give us as best of, best of a chance of completing the task as possible uh, by laying out different uh, things that we thought that we needed to hit, do them at smaller points rather than just one massive uh, software piece, piece of code, so we split it up in small sections so that we knew when we put it all together at the end it would work. So as part of the challenge, we followed the Leonardo project process. And as you can see, there are five different stages and we, we followed them all to ensure that our project requirements and expectations were on track. So we broke it down into the SDR, PDR, CDR, TR and demonstration and each of them had a date. So this created sort of smaller milestones or like more holistic milestones so that we knew exactly where we needed to be, what stage we needed to be at for the process and that made sure not only were we sort of less stressed because we were on time, on schedule, on reaching our milestones, we also knew, right guys, we need to make sure we get this done by this day. So if you at your business, that company that you work for has to sort of loose structure, I highly recommend you use those milestones because it does act as a nice skeleton guide. Uh, so we then went on to brainstorming. So uh, we came up, as you can see here, we've got three different ideas. Uh, these were just our original three ideas that we had. They gave us a good grounding to start off with uh, so that we had different ideas that we could either manipulate into our final idea. 
um, just to help with sort of design side of things and to make sure that we could actually physically make the product as well, because that was the main point for us. Um, we then came up with CAD drawings for it. So we uh, put together lots of smaller parts and then assembled them into one big assembly. We rendered the photos, which you can see in the top left. Um, and we used these during our SDRs and uh, CDRs to tell our mentors what we were actually uh, planning on doing and give them a physical view so that we're not just talking to them, they can actually see what our product should look like in the final. Uh, we also can created lots of drawings. So as you can see on the right, there's an example of one of them we created, which has dimensions and stuff like that, so that when we were later down the line, we could use that to either help build it uh, into uh, our 3D printed models or make any edits that we needed. Uh, we also completed FEA testing due to the fact that we were using uh, liquid. It's quite heavy, especially for 3D printing. So we wanted to make sure that the calculations that we did and we wanted to test that our product would be able to hold the amount of liquid that we wanted it to. So completing things like FEA testing is an extra bit on top that you can do. Uh, it's not necessarily needed, but we thought it would be a good idea just to make sure that we were uh, covered basically and that our product would be able to do what we expected it to. Uh, during manufacturing, obviously we were doing 3D printing. There were problems, you all come across problems in your projects. So our main problem was the fact that we didn't have 3D printers that were big enough to print our uh, print our project in a hole. So we had to cut it in half and then find a way to stick it together. So we, we ended up using glue, but we went over different, lots of different ways to um, do this. Obviously we wanted to do 3D printing because it was a very sustainable and environmentally friendly uh, way of doing it because you can reuse the pl plastic, you use environmentally friendly P uh, and PLA. We then moved on to electronics. Um, so we created detailed to schematics before doing anything physical because if there's something wrong with the schematic that you create, create uh, when you go to do it physically, it won't work. So to cut out a lot of that testing and trying time, we made sure that our schematic was perfect first, then moved on to breadboards. So tested it with a easily re uh, replaceable parts, um, just to make sure that it was working to how we expected it before we even thought about soldering anything. So once we tested on breadboards and we knew it worked, we then soldered it and got ready for our final, uh, put into our final product. So as part of the business case as well, you've got to consider the pricing and the profits and how this will affect the product over its life cycle and what you expect for um, the future of the product. So again, we mirrored a lot of what we learned during our placements and we found that having a range of apprentices at different stages in their sort of apprentice years really did support with sort of using each other's placements, using each other's experience and knowledge with the team, especially when I like, brainstorming. So we again used the Leonardo sort of T3 process for pricing. And this allowed us to understand the different costs of labour, whether that was engineering, project managers or project engineering managers. We made sure we looked at the whole picture holistically and applied it the same as what a large scale company like Leonardo would. And we also included the materials we we're going to purchase and ensured that even if there was like a risk, those materials weren't available. We'll have other um, materials that also fit in the budget, but fit the same specification of what we needed. So it sort of gave us that insurance as well. And we made sure that we abided to government requirements with products. You've got to do a lot of research with products and how it will actually be in the real, real, world in, real world in quotation marks. So by using our government requirements, we focused on warranty and how much that would um, be in the off price. And then of course we considered profit and then overhead budget for our risks and could see what our future projections would be like for our profit and if that was, um, worthwhile and we did make a few alterations around to get a higher percentage of project profit sorry so it's good to actually have experience and think about it holistically so then we demonstrated our products on the day and we pitched our hydration station to three different panels of judges who asked us lots of questions about our product and we made sure we were prepared. We had those different sheets and documents that we thought were important to have. We worked hard to ensure that this is a working prototype. So we had a demonstration to show that how accessible and easy to use our product was. And we made sure that we mentioned our expectations and our parts and our hopes, our hopes for the future. So we 
mentioned that in our future development, but we would include a voice recognition and speaker attached to help with um, individuals with hearing difficulties, oh, sorry, with speaking difficulties. Um, so, sorry, with sight difficulties. So it made sure that they were more accessible. We had different, um, we, we suggested as well having braille. So it's for individuals as well that needed extra support. So as you can see, the product is sealed shut, as Sam also mentioned. So we made a smaller product that is exactly the same. It's just a smaller, more concise size. So we were able to break it apart, explain the different components, our thoughts behind it. And I think this gave us a really holistic view of the project, of our, of our product as well, because we were able to see the inside, the nitty gritty, and you were able to sort of understand it fully. So in terms of highlights as well, the, our overall experience of this challenge, we all really enjoyed it. And we brainstormed some highlights and top tips that we wanted to feed back to the future, future years. So first of all, independence and responsibility. This is your own project. This is something you get to work on and take full responsibility for with your team. And we found it really encouraging that this was our project, this was our responsibility. We were leading something and perhaps as apprentices, we might not get the opportunity all the time. So having this one project that we were 100% doing ourselves was daunting, but a really good opportunity for growth. Networking, development and exposure. So you have the day in Coventry when you meet the other teams and you get to see everyone else's amazing products. You get to develop yourself as an individual, networking with different people internally as well, different senior levels. You get to have so much exposure. We got interviewed by amazing apprenticeships and we were introduced into a video. And that led to so many more other exposure opportunities. Teamwork and healthy competition. You're working with more apprentices, as Callum said in the video earlier. It was really great to work with people that you didn't get to work with normally. And of course, healthy competitions, having other competing teams and encouraging each other. And of course, holistic understanding of engineering projects and processes. So you get to see a project from a start to a finish and really understand the processes and ideas and components that all work together to make this one product in the end. Uh, and our, we've got a few top tips. So time management is quite important. So I know for especially us, the way that we did it with our SDRs and PDRs, it worked really well. So we were able to get everything done in time, ready for uh, the uh, the day in uh, September. So making sure you've got strict timelines and try and stick to those as best as possible uh, is a really good idea to keep you on top of everything and having a variety of skills in the team. Obviously you have your teams already. So if you haven't got that variety of skills, you need to either uh, reach out to people in the company, try and find that help because it does help quite a lot to have a range of skills in your team. And of course, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, and feel free to contact us if you've got any questions about our experience or the future. Perfect. Thank you both um, for presenting today. It's fantastic to hear um, your experience and I'm sure the teams appreciate any of the top tips that you've shared today. Um, so moving on to, uh, on the agenda, it um it's myself who will be covering um the key dates so what i'll do is i'll just share my slides again perfect so um let me turn on my camera as well so i'll be um just kind of outlining the key dates um and also the finals day format um for you all of the competition this has been circulated already um in your team um, packs um, but also on the website itself, but I'll just kind of outline them again um, for reference. So um, to start with, you'll have your presentation updates, which are your monthly submissions. So at the end of each month on a Friday by 5 p.m., you will need to submit a monthly update. Um, there is there was a template provided um, in your team packs. Um, which you can use, you can adapt it however you want, um, but we will encourage you to submit them on a monthly basis by 5 p.m. on the Friday of each month. The dates are on screen at the moment. This um, this will give you an opportunity to gain a, a few points um, per month, which will go towards your final um, score. 
um, of the competition. So it's important that you kind of keep up to date um, on a monthly basis, get these um, sent in by the machine platform, which uh, my colleague Chris will cover um, at the end um, of the webinar. Um, he'll kind of explain how to use it. If you haven't done so already, um, please do send in an email to the AEC inbox, um, nominating two members of your team to gain access uh, to Machine so that you can upload your documents. Uh, I know a few teams have already, but if you haven't, just let me know and I'll add you onto the system because the first deadline is tomorrow um, for your April submission. If you have any questions or issues, just let me know. And um, the next deadline is your team report. So this is due on the 7th of July. Um, so Toby, our head judge, he will cover this um, in a moment in terms of what we um, expect of the uh, team report and any guidance and tips on that. The next one is the presentation webinar. So this um, will take place on the 16th of August on Teams. It's online um, and joining instructions will be circulated um, out to everyone. It will most likely take place during the lunch hour, similar to today. But this will kind of give you an outline on what to expect at the finals day, a more in-depth explanation and also some guidance from our judge um, Raymond Hodgkinson who spoke earlier. He'll give you some guidance on um, how to put that together and kind of just advice on how to deliver on the final day for your um, demonstration. And finally it's um, the finals competition and award ceremony. So this is the live demonstration day that will take place at the Manufacturing Technology Centre in Coventry. This will be on the 29th of September, so please block your diaries um, for this day. It is a four day um, event from eight o'clock for um, setup um, until around five o'clock um, in the afternoon. So please block this out in your diaries and further information will be provided. Um, but to kind of give you a outline on what to expect, um, the finals day is a fantastic opportunity um, for yourselves to meet other teams, um, judges and those within within the industry. Um, there will be those of activities um, where you can have a chance to take uh, have the opportunity to um, get involved in like the media coverage. There'll be a photographer on site doing interviews um, with our media team. So if you're brave enough um, to do an individual interview on just your experience, um, anything like that, please feel free to nominate yourselves, but um, there'll be opportunity to do that on the day as well. Um, and also a fun team building exercise revolving a lighthouse challenge, building a lighthouse out of foil and paper. And also, um, possibly um, a tour of the workshop facilities at the MTC. Um, so that will be um, taking place alongside the finals day where you'll be delivering and presenting um, your project to our competition judges, um, just showcasing it and um, yeah, just um, showcasing your project to the judges for them to review and deliberate and uh, and to award um, the three winning categories for the grand champion um, with a £2,000 um, prize and also a highly commended award of £500 um, and finally the peer review award where um, there'll be a £20 um, Amazon voucher for each team member. So get these diaries, you get these um, dates in your diaries um, and it's important that if you haven't got your machine access, let us know. Um, and I think that's everything regarding key dates. Uh, if you have any questions, just pop it in the chat box and we'll address them at the end um, with the Q with, um, within the Q&A. So moving on, um, I'll hand over to Jack, who will cover the monthly updates from uh, for for the teams. Um, so Jack, over to you. OK, thanks, Fiona. So uh, with real projects, it's really important that we can promote and uh, and create some excitement and interest around the, the products that you're about to release. So if you click onto the next slide, please, Fiona. Uh, taking that thinking on into the, the project, 
we we input these monthly updates into the project. Sorry, Fiona, can I have the next slide, please? Sorry, I think it's frozen on my end. Just <laughs> a second. There you go. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, we took that thinking into the challenge um, and introduced these monthly updates from the teams. So uh, as Fiona mentioned, you've got the template and you can see the examples on the right hand side of the template there. Um, and she's already talked through the uh, the, the key dates and uh, we'll, we'll hear about the machine platform later. So with your consent, these, these will also be posted on the iMeki Facebook and Twitter accounts. Um, so we expect everyone, if they want the, the marks to be submitting these, they don't necessarily have to be posted um, to the iMeki accounts. Um, that will only be done with your consent if you're happy for that. And we've got two marks per post, five posts um, through the different months, so 10, 10 points available uh, in total. Uh, and one of those points per post will be for submission on time. Uh, the other point will be for professional high quality content, uh, eye catching images and, uh, and concise, skillful articulation of key points. So I think it mentions it in the uh, in the template there. You've got max 250 words per per post. So it's a little bit like a social media post, essentially. Um, and we're really trying to catch the attention of the target audience here. We want professional professional content. So think about lighting, uh, framing uh, in your photos. We've got some some good examples here where everything's in focus and it's well lit. Uh, and, and really think about the point you're trying to get across in each one. OK, thanks, Fiona. Thanks, Jack. Um, so if I just move on to the next slide, we'll introduce uh, Raymond again and uh, cover the business plan presentation. OK, thank you, Fiona. Um, maybe I can take a short picture of myself. I don't know if I can do that. Let's see. You'll probably have to share your own slides, Raymond. Yep. Would you like to do that? Well, no, I was going to just take control here and just be able to click through. Oh, okay. but it doesn't seem to work. So I have to let you click. OK, yeah, I'll click for you. Don't worry. OK, well, if you can click onto the first one, please. So there are five elements and key elements in any business plan. And we'll discuss each of these in turn on the following slides. Next. The product. Logically, your product is the focus of your business plan. You've obviously thought a lot about what to make, how to make it and why to make it. So consider what benefits does it offer, which other products do not have. These are known technically as unique selling points or USPs. Why would people want it? What products could compete? Do not just consider other products of the same type, but consider other products which could meet the same need. For example, if you've invented a super adhesive, competitive products could include sticky tape, nails and staple guns, for example. Next slide. The market. Here you have to look at who would want to buy it? How much will they pay for it? And how many are they likely to buy? And remember, the higher the price, the less numbers you're likely to sell, so it's a trade-off. Base your selling price on what people are prepared to pay rather than what the product costs, if at all possible. Show how you reach these figures. Market research. This can be a relatively small sample of friends, family and colleagues, or based on internet figures available. For example, X percent of the population own their own home but work all day, so they would be interested in our product. How will you get it to them? Technically called the path to market or route to market. Think about shipping costs, packing costs, insurance for items lost or damaged in transit. What about regulations? Do you need a CE mark? Are there health and safety requirements or fire regulations that have to be met? Does the product have a limited life cycle? If so, can you extend it by bringing out an updated model? I found you a classic case of how that one can work. Next slide, please. Your marketing strategy. First thing you have to decide is how are you going to get it to your customers? 
Are you going to sell directly to the end users? Or are you going to sell through a chain of shops, for example? If you do sell through a retail chain, then you'll have less cost for advertising and selling, but you will need to allow for a resale margin required by the shop. If nobody knows about your product, they're not going to buy it. So think about how you would advertise it. This does not only include social media and print advertising, but could, for example, mean getting local TV to mention it under local apprentices come up with a fantastic new idea or getting a celebrity to use it publicly on, t or on TV, known as product placement. How would you package it? Think of possible protection against damage in storage or damage in transit. Also think about appealing to the eye. People buy with their hearts more than with their head. As mentioned above, if you're selling through third parties, you are now to need to allow for resale discounts. What about after sales service and guarantee costs? This can both be a source of costs and a source of income. Spare parts and accessory sales after the guarantees expired, for example. Next slide, please. Talking of costs, you've got to look at various things on the costs. Don't base your business case on the prototype costs unless you do not anticipate any significant saving when going into mass production. Base it on the mass production costs. In addition to the individual production costs, you will have fixed costs, such as staff wages, electricity bills, factory rental or immortalization, which means just recovering the purchase price of the factory and equipment over a period of time, advertising costs, etc. If you're making direct deliveries, you'll have the cost of buying and running a fleet of vehicles to deliver it. Delivery costs can normally be added to production costs using an average figure. So can warranty costs. For example, on large capital equipment, as I've been associated with, accounting factors says you allow 2% of the selling price as guarantee costs per year. Next slide, please. Now we come to the finances. For each product in your study, combine, look at the periods. These might be months as a reviews, but you can select whatever period you think is sensible. Could be quarters or years or even seasons for a seasonal product where you're going to sell more in summer than winter. It's a good idea to use best case and worst case scenarios. And don't be put off if you show a loss in the initial period. This is absolutely normal, but you will need to factor in some sort of capital cost to cover this. That's easier now that interest rates are still relatively low. Show your results in a table or graph which can be appendices to your report. And I stress, put these as appendices, don't make them part of the body of the report. The example on the next page is purely fictitious, but yours should be based on your market study and cost analysis. So once you've got your costs together, multiply your net costs per unit by the sales number predicted, add the fixed costs, and that gives you your total cost for that volume of sales. Multiply the sales price by the volume predicted, and that gives you the income for that same volume. And the difference is your profit or loss on that period. Be realistic. The last CEO I knew who told his shareholders he was going to get a 33% profit on a new takeover found himself looking for a new job. Next slide, please. This is an example of how such a profit and loss calculation can look. Don't worry if you can't follow all the figures, but basically you just take the sales product number, which is the worst case and best case for each period. The costs and you come to add the fixed costs, you come to your unit cost for best and worst case. Multiply by the selling price, you come to the income for best and worst case. You come for your income to overall and accumulate these. In this case, in the best case, I'm back into profit in seven months. 
realistically that's probably quite ambitious, but it depends on the product and the nature of the market. And the worst case obviously is going to take a little bit longer before you actually start making money. This can be put graphically. Next slide, please which makes it much easier to see what's happening. And again, you see you're making a loss for the initial period and then coming back into profit. That's the worst case, that's the best case. So in either case, you do come into profit over a period of time. And as I say, don't be put off if it means two, three, four years to get into profit. That can be realistic if it's a good business and you're making good money after that. Next slide, please. Some final thoughts. And I don't want to encroach too much on the next presentation on business on report writing. But please, when you finish your business case, read it through, read it through again, and read it through yet again. And then get someone else to read it through for you. It's amazing when you think you've written something, that's what you'll see on the page, even if it isn't what it's standing there. Someone else will say, hey, that's not what you meant to say, is it? It'll be a shame to spoil all your hard work by just leaving in some typing or spelling errors. And don't trust Word for this. Some of the grammatical corrections offered by Word are either American English or, in my experience, just plain wrong. If you do use American English, that's absolutely acceptable, but be consistent. You've got to use it the whole way through the report. There's nothing more jarring for a reader than to see English English in one paragraph and American English in the next. It just doesn't read right. Thank you very much. Back to you, Fiona. Thanks, Raymond. Um, so we'll move on to our next section on report writing. So, Toby, are you there? Hi there, yes, I am. Perfect. Hi. Over so, to you. Thank you very much. So as I was introduced, my name is Toby Hegarty and I am the head judge within the Apprentice Automation Challenge. Uh, can I put you on to the next slide, please, Fiona? So in this, we're going to discuss each of the elements. You can just tab all the way through to the end of the two so that all, all the bullet points are present. So looking through the mark scheme and in that we're going to then discuss each of the subcategories. So design specification, manufacturing process, business case, uh, report presentation and structure, and then finally, one more, uh, another uh, a sort of update for a further bit of information on the monthly updates. And then finally, I'm going to add in some general tips for writing from that have been accumulated from the judges over the last time, uh, over the time the, the challenge has been running. So next slide, please. Next slide, please, Fiona. Oh, is it not moving? It's showing the mark scheme slide now. Oh yeah, it's, it's up, I think it must just slow an update on my end. So reports will be marked along the following criteria. So design specification at 30% of the mark, manufacturing process additionally at 30% of the mark, business case at 20%, presentation structure of the written reports, and there's one more, which is the monthly updates, which are also at 10%. Uh, one more, next slide, please. So into the nitty gritty elements are part of it. The design specification, oh, too far. Have you shown good design documentation and consider the different requirements of your prototype? Have you basically, in this instance, have you got a good design document? Have you shown how you're going to approach your, your how have you considered your approach? A part of this, have you displayed evidence of your design skills? Certain hardware and software might be appropriate for the prototype. So why have you selected them? In those, in that consideration, what else could you have used before you set on your chosen options? Um, thank you. There, next slide, please. The manufacturing process. Prototype manufacture is very different to mass manufacture. So in this, we want we, the judges are going to want to see: Have you considered the difference in hardware choices you might make from prototype versus mass manufacture? Three D printing is all fine, is all well and good for when you're doing prototyping, but may not necessarily translate as well for mass manufacture due to the length of, length of time for production and costs attached to it. Um, also, we would like to see information regarding the different stages of your manufacture. So show us a story going from a pile of raw components through to your finished prototype. Uh, next, please. 
Next point to add in the manufacturing process. Have you shown strong supporting evidence for your decisions? No project typically works right first time. We'd like to see where things have failed and what necessarily you may have learned from that and how you've improved your successes going forward. Business case. So Raymond has already discussed this, so this is just a, a, for a few small additional elements. Have you shown good use of business analysis techniques? Raymond showed you the profit and loss chart, but additional techniques to consider would be SWOT, PESTLE. These are by no means exhaustive, but these are some things to consider. Again, as Raymond's asked, what market research have you done? Are you a new product to the market? Is there an existing market or are there existing competitors? What unique selling point does your product offer that is not presently available on the market that might draw customers towards you? Uh, but as I said, this will be covered in more detail. This <laughs> would have been covered in more detail, but this is from an earlier slide back where I think it was, swept, it was sw switched around. So next slide, please. Report presentation and structure. First point. Is the report clear and concise? The report templates you will have been sent out, or if you haven't had them already, um, will have a word limit for each section. Try and stay within this word limit as much as possible. Um, it is an easy way to lose marks by straying too far over that limit. We won't be strict about it, but try and stay within that limit. Is the report well structured under the sections flow in a logical manner? Tell a story. There's no point discussing elements of mass manufacture if you haven't finished if you haven't finished telling us about your design. Uh, next point on this one is. Have you ensured your report is free from grammatical and spelling errors? Raymond's already touched on this, but it is incredibly important. Hey, Raymond, has, Raymond has suggested proof get proofreading proofread everyone's sections. Anything that's not your own, get someone else to proofread it. Next point, please. Oh, on to the monthly updates. No, that was the last one of that one, so month. Oh no, there was one more. Sorry, so <laughs> the citations. <laughs> That's the one. Citations. Have you made use of citations? For UK report writing, the Harvard uh, method is the is the preferred one, but at the end of the day, as long as you've used citations and you're using a consistent style throughout. We're not going to be too concerned just as long as they're present and they've been presented correctly. So next one is on the monthly updates. This is something that Jack has touched on as well. So each update is worth two marks. And there are and the five sections are as it's going to be shown in your templates that you have received by the end of April. Meet the team. Tell us about yourself. Introduce yourselves. Tell us about your backgrounds. For the end of May, hopefully by this point in time, you will have decided what problem you wish to tackle for your project. So tell us about it. Tell us why you've selected it. The end of June, the design concept. So show us some initial stages of your design solving problem, maybe different approaches you could you could approach to. To um, solve this to coming up with a solution to your problem. End of July, how has your design developed further? What changes had to made? Have you had to go back to the drawing board again? Tell us about it. It's always interesting to know. Finally, for the end of August, your manufacturing process. Hopefully by this point in time, you should be starting to put things together. So again, give us some information. Tell us what you've done. All of these slides have an additional benefit of, as Jack has said, 10 marks total. They're easy marks, five marks just for submitting on time. They also add some benefit to your report writing for, well, not so much the end of August, but the previous four, they can all be included as in base information that you can expand upon for when you're writing up your reports. So next slide, I think, is my top is the top tips. So there's there's five main tips. It's been mentioned by Raymond. It's going to be mentioned by me again. Proofread your report before submission. And proofread everyone else's, not your own. You're too close to the subject matter. You will necessarily miss things, as Raymond has stated. Get people who aren't involved in the project to proofread if you can as well. Again, stick to the section word limits. We won't be strict with it, but it's a target, not a goal. Try and get as close as you can, trying to go over the top. Use of figures and tables. Picture says a thousand words. It's an old, it's an old, but it's true. 
Only include images, however, in the main body of your report if they're directly referenced by the text. Use it to expand upon a point you've already made, not necessarily just throw a picture in to fill up space. Place in any images, figures, tables that you feel are relevant, but not directly referenced by your, by your report down in the appendix. Report style. Hopefully, every member of your team will equally contribute to the report, but you will all have your own writing styles typically. So try and ensure that the report is, is once it's been compiled together, is then proofread and, proofread and edited to follow a continuous voice, passive voice throughout. No eyes and no eyes and personal pronouns. Passive all the way through. Third person if necessary. Lastly, keep the report focused on the prototype you're developing. It's always interesting to hear about other approaches and other problems you could have tackled, but we want you to focus in on one net, on one thing. This is the prototype that you're developing. I think that is the end of my slides, so I will hand you back to Fiona. Thank you very much for listening. Perfect. Thanks, Toby. That's fantastic. Um, moving on to our final um, section of the webinar is the Machine um, Document Submission Platform, which my colleague Chris Mout, if you are on the line, um, I'll hand <laughs> it over to you. Yes, good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for, for everyone else for their uh, their input and points over the last uh, hour. Um, I'll keep this nice and short and sweet. Um, so as uh, well, multiple people have mentioned, uh, Mashum is our uh, preferred document uh, hosting platform of choice. Um, uh, and just to reiterate as well, if you need access, drop Fiona a quick email to the UAS challenge, uh, sorry, the uh, AAC.challenge at imeki.org email address. Um, it's very easy to use. Um, what you do is when you log into it with um, uh, either of your two members accounts, uh, there'll be opportunities where you can upload the documents um, for each of the month submissions. Um, I've posted a link um, in the uh, chat as well, um, and we'll certainly put it in the video description of the key dates so you can see some of the document, uh, the document um, uh, submission deadlines. Always good to have those on a Gantt chart if uh, if you do have uh, a centralised place where you work. Um, generally speaking, we can see when these things have been uploaded. Um, and as in the real world, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, as in the real world, uh, deadlines are always a very important thing. So if you feel like you're going to miss something, um, do think about submitting yours early. Uh, a good sort of rule of thumb that I do is anything that needs to be done. I try and look at it uh, so that I can get it done maybe 48 hours beforehand. Um, we know that you're going to be busy. This isn't the only thing you're going to be doing in your time, whether you've got something in your personal life or maybe you, your actual uh, employer wants you to do another project. Um, so have a think about a plan B, C, D, E, F as necessary. Um, it's easy points to get uh, for each of the submissions, um, which also means it's very easy to lose those points as well uh, by just not uh, submitting them or submitting them late. Um, and of course, if we have problems with the machine platform, don't worry, we will be a bit lenient. However, and to my knowledge, it's been pretty rock solid so far. So take that with a pinch of salt. Um, there are no size limits to any of the things that you can upload as well. Um, so as mentioned by Jack um, and as also by uh, Toby, uh, we want to see what you've been up to. Um, it's your opportunity to give a little progress update, a little sort of um, uh, pulse check about what you've been up to. So we want to see photos of your team, um, any sort of CAD work that you might be working on, uh, photos of you doing a bit of testing, maybe a bit of manufacturing um, and, and maybe even uh, getting your prototype out there. Um, a, a sort of like a v1 version or maybe something that you're uh, ready to present um, if you have video sure we'd have that um, but certainly we'll, we'll certainly take anything uh, that you're able to share and talking about sharing obviously we've talked about uh, opt-ins um, now as this is a an engineering project that is as close to the real world as it gets we understand you might be very competitive and don't necessarily want to share all the details um, that's absolutely fine so just make sure that you you um, indicate that when you submit your content uh, but other than that um, so what will happen when you submit all your content for the uh, for tomorrow's deadline um, is I'll get a hold of that and we'll start sending that out through the social media channels that we've got, which are Facebook and Twitter. Um, I have a couple of bits of advice. Uh, I've worked with um, 
student and apprentice challenges in my entire time at the IMICI, which is about seven years now. Um, and I think I'll be echoing a lot of what um, has already been covered, especially by uh, previous ch uh, challenge winners, which was uh, an excellent thing to review, um, is certainly to have a look over this video. Um, do go through some of the points that they were talking about. Um, certainly the, the point about Gantt charts is a particularly useful thing for project work. Don't know what a Gantt chart is? Don't worry, go up and find out about it, um, which segues very nicely onto uh, our library that we have at the IMEC -E. uh, We've made great strides uh, during COVID to digitize everything, and it is the biggest resource that's available for all mechanical engineers. So um, simple uh, point to get access is get an IMEC -E, um, a membership number, which is free for all apprentices taking part in the challenge, uh, and then go and visit the, the lovely people over at the iMickey library and you'll be able to get access to that. Um, and that's not necessarily useful. It could uh, not necessarily just for the apprentice automation challenge. You could find it very useful for anything like coursework or indeed sort of work that you're doing as part of your um, uh, a work as an apprentice engineer at your companies. Um, but finally, uh, do enjoy the experience. It's it's a great thing to get involved with, um, being able to sort of to work on a, a real world project and get feedback like this. Um, it is an incredibly valuable thing for for any of the participants, um, and certainly it's it's a joy to see everyone at the finals event um, and and a chance to see your hard work. So please do enjoy the next few months and best of luck with your prototypes. Thanks, Chris. That was great. Uh, moving on is the Q&A session. So if any of you have any questions, please pop it in the chat box or feel free to raise your hand um, and you can um, ask. So Hassan, do you want to just unmute yourself? Yeah. Hello, Fiona. Thank you all for the session. My question yeah. is regarding the monthly updates. So Obviously, all on the PowerPoints is mentioned starting from April. So, from April, you got to submit the team and the meet the team slide and then the manufacturing yes. slide. What will be submitting from tomorrow? What's there to submit for tomorrow? Yes, so I've I've noticed this um, in the background. So um, the dates were actually reflected incorrectly um, in the um, your team packs. So the monthly updates are actually so there's no deadline tomorrow. The uh, monthly updates is from April to August. So that's five months, April to August on Friday by 5 p.m. Uh, so Friday at the end of the month from April to August. Yeah, so hopefully that will clarify I was like, wow, tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> so apologies. Um, it was just reflected right. um, incorrectly on the on the team packs. My apologies. Okay. Perfect. And and just to add as well, if you do have any questions about what to add or perhaps sort of uh, have any queries of um, maybe sort of not sure exactly what to put down, um, do get in touch with us. We're happy to, to assist. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, Hassan. Any any other questions? If I can't see anyone's hands being raised, please um, someone else point it out because I'm screen sharing. We don't have anything in the chat box, so just give it a few minutes. Just to reiterate, monthly updates are April to August. You'll update them, uh, upload them onto Machine, to which just email me via the AEC, um, dot, I'm, dot challenge at imeki.org email address, and I will add you to the system uh, with your two team members who have been nominated, and you can upload it onto there. I've got another question. Yes, <laughs> go ahead. So I understand the monthly submissions are in PowerPoints. You know, the final report. How would you want that? Would you want it as a Microsoft Word document or that um, as a PowerPoint? You will also upload that onto Machine. So use um, Machine as your documenting, your document um, sharing platform between yourselves, uh, between the team, yourself and yeah. um, us. Um, would, that's you the AC that, team. would you want that as a PowerPoint, the final one, or as a Microsoft Word document? So the report, you can up, upload it as a Word document or a PDF. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Fiona. Okay, so 
I'm going to take it as there's no further questions, but as I mentioned, if you have any, just um, pop them to my direction. And if it's a technical question, I will um, forward that over to the judges and they'll be able to advise accordingly. So all that's to do today is to thank you um, to all the presenters and all team members who have been able to join. Um, oh. I've got one question from Joshua. Has the report template been released? Um, if it's not on the website um, already, it will be circulated out by email from myself um, nearer to the uh, report deadline, so over the next couple of months. So just keep an eye out for that if it's not uploaded onto the website. But once um, it's been sent over, it will be added to the website. Hopefully, Joshua, that answers your question, but it will be provided to you in advance. OK. Perfect, so any further questions just yeah, email them through, um, but thank you all for um, participating today. As I said, the webinar will be recorded and shared on our YouTube channel. I will also circulate this via emails. Um, so yeah, I think that's everything. Um, thank you all and have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Fiona. Thank you very much. And good luck, teams. Thank Thanks, you, Raymond. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, everyone.